हेलो गाइस हाउ आर यू आई एम हरदीप सिंह वेलकम बैक टू योर ओन यूट्यूब चैनल आल्स अपडेट्स एंड रीसेंट एग्जाम्स फॉर मोर अपडेट्स रिलेटेड टू रीसेंट आल्स एग्जाम राइटिंग दस टॉपिक्स लिस्टनिंग रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट एंड स्पीकिंग क्यू कैट गेस वर्क प्लीज गाइस पार्टिसिपेट इन एवरी डे लिस्टनिंग एंड रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट टू अचीव योर डिजायर बैंड स्कोर इन योर एक्चुअल आल्स एग्जाम Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page Alts Updates and Recent Exams. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between an agent from the student job center and a student who wants to find a part-time job. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3 Good morning. Oh, good morning. Is this uh room number 316? Yes, that's right. So, is this the student job center? It certainly is. How may I help you? Well, actually, I'm looking for a job, a part-time job. Do you have anything available at the moment? Ah, yes. Are you a registered student? I'm afraid this service is only available to full-time students. Yes. I'm doing my degree in statistics studies. Here's my student card. Right. Well, let's just have a look at what positions are available at the moment. There is a job for social workers and the workplace is in the house of the disabled. That would be fine for me. What are the hours like? You'll have to work every day and the payment is $9 per hour. However, the skills required are not very basic, so 3 days of training is needed. The pay is quite good though I'm in my second year of study now and must attend some courses during the daytime so I'm afraid I can't make it for this one do you have any other positions you know ones that I could spare more class free time on that's not good then um let's see here there is one for security guards in the supermarket what about the pay the salary is pretty standard for this one it's $25 per hour great That's much higher than I would have expected. Are there any special qualities required? It sure offers quite a good salary. Um there's almost no requirement for this job except that you must wear a uniform which is provided. That's very nice then. But what about exact working hours for this? I hope it will be okay for me. The working time is from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and you only need to work 3 days each week. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. That sounds like fun. But unfortunately, I've got other arrangements during the weekdays. So that's not possible either, I'm afraid. Hmm. Well, I think we do have something else for you. Yes, here it is. There is a vacancy for a van driving position in a furniture company that might suit you. What is the working time for this one? On the weekends? No, it's night work. That's good to hear cuz I'm available for most of the late hours. And the good thing for this is that you've got variable hours to choose from, though the payment is fixed. Any other restrictions for this one? Yeah, it requires the driver to have reliable driving skills, you know, in case of unnecessary damage or any unwanted possibilities of accidents. Night work is perfect, but I don't even have a driver's license. 
not to mention my horrible driving skills. Hmm, no driver's license. That makes it impossible at all. All right. The last option that might suit you is a job as a data entry clerk. You'll be expected to work in a school. It's actually a good place, you know. Lovely. And what about the working hours? Not on weekdays, I hope. Actually, you'll be working only on weekends. You get a fixed salary and you're expected to be familiar with keyboarding skills. That's not the only limit, though, because I'm afraid personal transport is also a must. That's not a problem. I've got a bicycle to travel around with. Great. Now, just fill out this form and we'll see what to do next. Wonderful. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. You'll hear a talk between an interviewer and an interviewee called Chris Evans from the Royal Caledonian Curling Club about ice curling. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Today, we're pleased to have on the show Chris Evans from the Royal Caledonian Curling Club. Now, let's welcome Chris to tell us something about ice curling. Chris, please. Thank you. It's my honour to briefly talk about ice curling here to all of you. So let's start with what curling is. Curling is a sport in which players slide stones on an ice rink towards a target area which is segmented into four concentric circles. Two curling teams consist of four players, the lead, the second, the third, and finally the skip. The captain of the curling team and its players will throw their stones in the order stated above. Each team has eight stones. The purpose is to accumulate the highest score in the game. Points are scored depending on which stone is resting closest to the center of the target area at the end of the game. The ice surface on which the game is played or the rink in curling is called the sheet. It is covered with tiny droplets of water that become ice and cause the stones to curl or deviate from a straight path. The curling players should slide the heavy polished stones or rocks across the ice curling sheets towards the house, a circular target marked on the ice, as I've mentioned before. There are several pieces of equipment essential for a curling game, so a concise instruction will be given to you. The most important things are the curling brush, which is used to sweep the ice surface in the path of the stone, as well as the curling stone, which is sometimes called rock. The former is usually made of horsehair, and the latter is made of granite, mainly coming from Scotland. Curling shoes are similar to ordinary athletic shoes, except that the two shoes in a pair have dissimilar soles. The sole of the slider shoe, which is designed for the sliding foot, is typically made of Teflon, while the gripper shoe for the hack foot has a special layer of rubber applied to the sole. During the curling game, you may also find a stopwatch attached either to the player's clothing or the broom, which is used to time the stones over a fixed distance to calculate their speed. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, a word about the development of curling clubs. Curling is thought to have been invented in medieval Scotland, and outdoor curling was very popular in Scotland between the 16th and 19th centuries, as the climates provided good ice conditions every winter. Kilsyth Curling Club is renowned as the first club in the world, having been formally constituted in 1716 and widely influencing ice curling development. In Kilsyth today, both men's and ladies' sections are thriving, participating in all major competitions and having won championships in the British Open in the past. The mother club of curling, Grand Caledonian Curling Club, was instituted in 1838 for the purpose, not as such to attract people's interest, but to regulate the ancient Scottish game of curling by general laws. With these official rules, the young curlers could be trained in a more professional way. By 1842, the new national club had sought to obtain royal patronage, and it has ever since been known as the Royal Caledonian Curling Club. However, many sports, such as athletics and tennis, were frowned upon as being too recreational and not practical enough. So the Crown banned them by law during the 1300s, in the hope that men would instead practice the archery skills that were seen as vital to the country's defence and the ban was lifted in the 17th century. So, do you know the reason for curling being kept during the 16th century? Is it because it was so popular, or because people from all ages like children could play it? The spirit of curling dictates that one never cheers mistakes, misses, or gaffes by one's opponent, and most importantly, all the team members should strictly follow the instructions of their captain, which is essential for men in battle. Curling was brought to Canada from Scotland and some curling was played informally before 1800. Curlers often used iron curling stones made from melted materials such as cannonballs rather than granite until the early 1900s because there were transport problems importing granite stones from Scotland. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear two students talking about the MOA with the lecturer. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Thank you all for coming here today to hear about the moa, a kind of animal which has been extinct for a long time. Well, first of all, we look at what the moa are. The moa are nine species of flightless birds endemic to New Zealand. They were the dominant herbivores in New Zealand's forest, shrubland and subalpine ecosystems for thousands of years. But around 500 years ago, they all went extinct. When I mention extinct animals during ancient times, you may immediately think of dinosaurs, which disappeared around 66 million years ago. Fossils of dinosaurs, which we use to study, are large in number, but not many of those of Moa remain, though both animals appeal to people today. So, the Moa sound more mysterious now. But, sir, I've got a question about these flightless birds. How can we distinguish them from other birds? That's a good question. Birds are commonly characterised by being warm-blooded, having feathers and wings, usually capable of flight, and laying eggs, while the flightless mower, until their extinction, were the largest birds in the world. 
Their heads are relatively small in relation to their bodies, and they are the only wingless birds lacking even the vestigial wings and substantial tail bones in their family. That's impressive, but were they born to be like that? I mean, when they were chicks? Yes, absolutely. So let's move on to the chicks. The eggs of moa were laid in nests and incubated for about two months. The chicks would be well developed upon hatching and probably would be able to leave the nests to feed on their own almost immediately. I've heard that the male moa are thought to have incubated the eggs. Is that true? I think there is a possibility for that. I've read somewhere that the sex-specific DNA recovered from the outer surfaces of eggshells suggested that these eggs were likely to have been hatched by the male, but we still need to consult more. But I have a question. There has been some occasional speculation that the moa were still alive, because someone said they had caught sight of them in New Zealand in the late 19th century, or even the 20th. Do you think it's possible? I'm not amazed by that, since that kind of thing has been claimed several times. But I find it funny, because no reliable evidence of moa tracks has ever been found and experts still contend that moa survival is extremely unlikely. So what was the reason for the moa's extinction? I wonder if it was global warming or some other factors related to their living environment. Well, before the arrival of human settlers in New Zealand, the moa's only predator was the massive Haas eagle. Then the Maori arrived sometime before CE 1300, and all moa genera were soon driven to extinction by hunting. What a horrible thing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 27 to 30. All right. Now, let's look at the features of some species of moa. The South Island giant moa may have been the tallest birds ever known. And the second tallest of the nine moa species is the North Island giant moa, with the females being markedly larger than males, both in weight and height. And I've heard that the smallest of the moa birds are the coastal moa. Is that right? Yes, you were right. And have you heard about any other kind of moa before? I know the crested moa. The eggs they laid may be larger than others. As they mainly lived in the remote interior of the southern island, their fossils are rare or absent in archaeological sites, and no egg remains have yet been identified. Are there any species of moa that have got more fossils? Yes, of course. A considerable amount of remains of the stout-legged moa exist, due to the well-preserved properties of their habitat. Their skulls reveal relatively bad vision, a good sense of smell, and a very short bill. Then there is the eastern moa. They were remarkable in having very long and narrow windpipes, which probably enabled them to make louder, more resonant calls than those of other moa, and had the greatest vocal abilities, so they could communicate when they could not see each other in the forest or at night. They used a range of senses, apart from sound, in their search for food, such as their sense of smell and vision. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You will hear part of a lecture about time measurement. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about the research project I've been involved in on time measurement. Do you know how time is measured? Consider how we measure length and how, with time, we encounter a difficulty. Before we could grasp it, it would slip through our fingers. In fact, as we can see, we are forced to have the resource to measure something else. The movement of something in space or a set of movements in space. All the methods that have been employed so far really measure time by a motion in space. The measurement of time is no easy matter. A scientific unit only arrived at after much thought and reflection. As the most primitive form of measurement, the sun seems to be natural. Ever since man first noticed the regular movements of the sun and stars, we have wondered about the passage of time. Prehistoric people first recorded time according to the sun's position. To start off, let us take noon, which is when the sun is on the meridian at the highest point of its course across the heavens, and when it casts the shortest shadow. But this measurement, which was regarded as a major one in ancient times, was less important than the natural events that occurred. The earliest natural events that had been recognised were in the heavens, but during the course of the year, there were many other events that indicated significant changes in the environment. Seasonal winds and rains, the flooding of rivers, the flowering of trees and plants, and the breeding cycles or migration of animals all led to natural divisions of the year, and the further observation and local customs led to the recognition of the seasons. Years later, precise measurements were invented because the passage of time was extremely important for astronomers and priests who were responsible for determining the exact hour for daily rituals and for important religious festivals. Apart from the connection with religion, accurate time measurement was also related to the government, since they divided the day or the night into different periods in order to regulate work and various events. For thousands of years, devices had been used to measure and keep track of time. The current sexagesimal system of time measurement dates back to approximately 2000 BCE from the Sumerians. It was found that the earliest ancient timekeepers were mainly invented and used in Mesopotamia, where the water clock was introduced from, as well as in North Africa, especially in the area of ancient Egypt. So, now I'd like to introduce you to some of the most well-known ancient timekeepers, as well as the disadvantages of them, for which they were replaced by various new forms of clocks that were used afterwards. A sundial is a device that tells the time of day by the apparent positioning of the sun in the sky. In the narrowest sense of the word, it consists of a flat plate and a gnomon which casts a shadow onto the dial. As the sun appears to move across the sky, the shadow aligns with different hour lines which are marked on the dial to indicate the time of day. However, it was quickly noted that the length of the day varied at different times of the year Therefore, there could have been a difference between clock time and sundial time. In addition, the sundial was of no use at night, so a water clock was invented. The water clock, or clepsydra, appeared to have been invented around 1500 BCE and was a device which relied on the steady flow of water from or into a container. Measurements could be marked on the container or on a receptacle for the water. It was reliable, but the water flow still depended on the variation of pressure and temperature from the top of water in the container. As the technology of glass blowing developed from some time in the 14th century, it became possible to make sand glasses. Originally, they were used as a measurement for periods of time like lamps or candles. But as clocks became more accurate, they were calibrated to measure specific periods of time. The drawback, however, as you can imagine, was the limited length of time they could measure. The last timekeeper to be introduced is the fire candle clock. Candle clocks took advantage of a simple concept, the slow and consistent nature of a burning wax candle. By utilising this process, our ancestors were able to keep steady track of the time. The clocks were created by engraving the length of the candle with evenly spaced markings. 
Each marking represented a single unit of time, and, as the wax burned down, each hour would disappear. However, the drafts and the variable quality of the wax mainly influenced the time of burning. Like oil lamps, candles were used to mark the passage of time from one event to another rather than tell the time of day. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll submit some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking, you got guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com. The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.